And I call on the Minister, Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be opening today's debate. Uh, as we know, social isolation and loneliness is a very important issue. And as our society changes, there has been increasing recognition of social isolation and loneliness as a major public health issue that can have a significant impact on physical and mental well-being. This increased understanding is welcome. And I want to pay tribute to the important work of the Equal Opportunities Committee of the last Parliament in taking forward their groundbreaking inquiry into age and social isolation. This has been pivotal in getting the issue onto the public agenda and the policy agenda, and it's led directly to the commitment from this government in our manifesto for the last Scottish Parliament elections to publish a strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness. Presiding officer, I was delighted just before Christmas to launch A Connected Scotland, the Scottish Government's strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness and build stronger social connections. I visited Bridgend Farmhouse, which is a fantastic example of a community-based project supporting people to connect socially and where the farmhouse itself is an example of one of the first urban assets to be transferred under community empowerment legislation. I would urge everyone in here to get along for a visit. You'll really enjoy it. And I'm delighted to see that the farmhouse has recently been shortlisted for the 2019 McEwen Award, which, as an award that recognises architecture for the common good, it, it, it is fitting with our increasing understanding of the importance of placemaking and helping, foster, helping to foster that connection that we seek. So in developing the strategy, it was essential that we spoke to those with lived experience as well as the organisations who are doing the vital work day in, day out to support individuals and foster greater social connections. That's why we held consultation events the length and breadth of Scotland to hear what matters to people and communities. We were helped tremendously by the energy of local organisations who brought together their own communities to send in a response. We received well over 400 responses to the consultation, a sign of the importance that people place upon this issue and an indication of the appetite for real and meaningful change. To frame the discussion, we set out our vision for a Scotland where individuals and communities are more connected and everyone has the opportunity to develop meaningful relationships regardless of age, status, circumstances or identity. And we define social isolation as when an individual has an objective lack of social uh, relationships at individual, group or community or societal levels and loneliness as a subjective feeling experienced when there is a difference between the social relationships we would like to have and those that we actually have. So tackling social isolation and loneliness is not just the responsibility of one government or even of one portfolio in government. It is the collective responsibility of all of us to play our part in building a stronger social connections and more resilient communities. Reality is that social isolation and loneliness can affect anyone at any age or stage in life, at any walk of life. And in my role as Minister for Older People and Equality, this is my responsibility to help to embed equality and human rights across the work of the Scottish Government. Social isolation and loneliness is an undoubtedly an issue for older people, as we know, and this can be due to a number of factors, including the barriers they experience and the attitudes that they face. This needs to change, which is why we'll be bring, we will be bringing forward the older people's framework in the spring to promote positive attitudes to ageing, tackle discrimination against the older people and break down the barriers which prevent older people from living their best lives. However, let me be absolutely clear that social isolation and loneliness should not be seen purely in the context of ageing. It impacts on all parts of society. A third of children calling Childline are doing so because they feel lonely. We know that for new mothers, that the time after the birth of a child can be incredibly isolating and our veterans can face challenges in building their social networks on return from service. Yes, yeah, certainly. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I met with a group of eight organisations in my constituency yesterday, all of whom have lost funding as a result of a flawed integrated joint board bidding process, largely because they had all put in for crash provision, which the IJB said was not provided for in the funding round. Does the Minister agree that that is a myopic view, considering what she's just said about mothers seeking to break down isolation? And will she meet with me to see if the Scottish Government can help these organisations? Christina McKelvey. 
Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely uh, uh, d delighted to meet with, with um, uh, Alex Cole Hamilton to, to discuss these issues. Um, and he makes a, 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 a few fair points there on some of the issues and the challenges that we face in the, the upcoming budget uh, negotiations that we currently have. He, he will know that these decisions have IGIBs, but I am happy uh, to have that conversation with him. But I do know my colleagues in health have been working very closely with that local IGIB to look at some of those issues and how they can take that forward. But we can certainly have a conversation on how we do that. Presiding officer, we, we know uh, this is a whole population issue and to tackle it we need to recognise the commonality of experience as well as the distinctive way these experiences manifest themselves in different groups of people. And taking forward the strategy, we have set four clear priorities. Firstly, we want to empower communities to build shared ownership of this agenda. Social isolation and loneliness can't be solved by the Scottish Government alone and we are committed to working collaboratively with a range of partners as we move forward with our strategy. We know that the people and communities of Scotland know what is best for them. So, through our approach to uh, community empowerment and public service reform, we want to enable these communities to make a difference in their own terms, in their own communities. So last year we launched a local governance review in partnership with COSLA and through the review we will work with communities to understand what changes to the current system would allow them to have greater control over the decisions that have the biggest impact on their lives. And through the Community Choices Fund, we will continue to work in partnership to help local authorities reach their goal of having at least 1% of their budget subject to participatory budgeting, giving communities a better say in how that budget is spent. How people relate to each other is also critical in building social connections. That's why helping our young people build an early understanding of positive and healthy relationships, promoting the value of kindness and encouraging greater inter intergenerational dialogue are also important. We have placed health and wellbeing as a, a core element of Curriculum for Excellence to support our young people as they progress through their education. And all staff in schools are expected to be proactive in promoting positive relationships and behaviour in the classroom, playground and wider school community. We will implement the recommendations of the Personal Social Education Review published last week to ensure that our young people are developing the knowledge, skills and resilience to fulfil their potential. And this will help equip our young people to build and maintain those connections. Yes, certainly. Rachel Hamilton. Intervention. Uh, just in your point there um, about uh, schools um, supporting young people with social isolation, according to Versus Arthritis, 42% of young adults with arthritis feel uh, isolated and 73% say that they feel lonely on a regular basis. Um, it's important that we um, support these young people who are feeling isolated because of condition. And I just wondered um, how the Minister would suggest that um, those people who cannot get to school can be supported and to feel uh, included. Christina McKelvey. Yeah, there, there's, there's many, many ways. I could probably take up all of the rest of my speaking time and answer that because there's many ways to tackle this. This morning, um, I was at Dunbar uh, High School uh, where they have a cross-generational project with working with the young people and the, the, the older people there and some of the really innovative work that's happening everywhere. I've been absolutely blown away by some of the work that I have seen. But there is some particular issues where young people face some of the challenges, especially young people who have d disabilities or life uh, um, li long-term conditions. And we're looking at that. That's why the implementation group has such a varied uh, group of stakeholders on it in order for us to identify those issues much more clearly than maybe we know now and take forward some of the action to do that but that's what the implementation group I will hope will inform the work that we need to do to change that for those young people it's, it's a great point and one that we're taking on board um, one of the other issues that we face presiding officers is the stigma, stigma that exists around uh, social isolation and loneliness um, and we will help raise awareness of these issues encourage people to both seek and support and reach out to others that's why we're committed to working with partners and stakeholders just like I had explained to Rachel Hamilton there we know this is not straightforward and we have much to learn uh, and from a successful anti-stigma campaigns like See Me, uh, the fact that we're talking about this in the Scottish Parliament today is an important step in raising the awareness and focus, focusing the attention of society on the issue and I know that's a particular interest to the Conservative members here. Every member will know that there is a huge range of activity going on across Scotland. Please, I think I wrote to you all to say go and have a look at what's happening in your constituencies because you will be absolutely blown away and there's so much good work going on there and I would urge you to go and see that. But I want to particularly emphasise the importance of volunteering across Scotland. Volunteering is key to us uh, achieving this ambition, creating a fairer, more connected and more prosperous country with a quality of 
opportunity for all, a country where everyone has a chance to participate. And we know that there is a real two-way benefit to volunteering, as, we are, as well as help, helping foster a sense of purpose and supporting the cause. It helps improve social connectedness and volunteers meet new people, expand their networks and feel a connectedness to the wider society through their work. So, um, as you'll know, we are public, uh, the publication of the National Volunteering Outworks Framework is coming up uh, uh, this year, and we want to drive that involvement further. Presiding officer, we live, the lived environment is a key factor in how we interact with each other. From innovative housing solutions and intergenerational approaches to the accessibility of transport networks and improving access to digital connectivity, we want to create the conditions that enable individuals and their communities to thrive. And we want to work across different sectors to achieve this. Recognising the unique position of third sector organisations in supporting and developing the delivery of locally relevant solutions in a way that suits the needs of individuals. And that's why all of those briefings that we've all received in our inboxes today are so varied because we need to hear all of those voices in this and we are grateful to them for that. So in recognition of the fact that government cannot deliver the ambitions of the strategy alone and for the importance of a cross-sectoral approach in tackling these issues, I was pleased to announce earlier today the membership of the National Implementation Group for a Connected Scotland. Formed of a range of statutory, third and public sector organisations as part of this, their work, this group will develop and implement a shared delivery plan for the strategy, along with a shared performance framework to help us understand the difference we're actually making. To support this, we're committing £1 million of investment over the next two years to help build our collective capacity to implement the strategy and to pilot innovative approaches to tackling social isolation and loneliness. We've committed to reviewing how we can maximise the impact of existing funding into the communities. In that context, I want to touch briefly on the Labour Amendment and in the spirit of consensus by which I hope this debate is marked. While local authorities are responsible for setting their own budgets, the total funding available, including the flexibility to increase council tax by 3%, will increase by over £485 million in 1920 for local authorities. We want to work collaboratively with local government and others in tackling these issues, and that's why I'm pleased COSLA is a key partner on the new national implementation group. But tackling these issues are a bit more about than just money or projects. The reality is that we all have a responsibility to ensure our communities are more connected. There's no quick fix to this. And that's why your strategy is looking forward all the way to 2026 in order to do this. So in conclusion, presiding officer, to those who have joined me in the chamber today, I welcome this opportunity to debate this most important issue. And I hope you will join government in playing your part in helping tackle social isolation and loneliness and building a more connected Scotland. Presiding officer, as our first national strategy for tackling social isolation and loneliness, a connected Scotland represents the first step towards our vision of a more connected Scotland and demonstrates our commitment to creating a society which treats all of our people with kindness dignity and compassion, I move the motion in my name. Can I remind all those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? And I call on Annie Wells to speak to and move Amendment 15609.1. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I too welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate on social isolation and loneliness. Whilst this is an issue that comes up time and time again, particularly around Christmas time, we are yet to really tackle an issue which affects so many of us. As I have said before in this chamber, this is an issue that we all have our part to play in solving. And what I hope to see from the national strategy is direction required to achieve complete cultural change. Though putting forward my own ideas on how best to achieve this and urging the Scottish Government to push ahead with its plans, I will be using my debate time to push for consensus on an issue which we must all unite on. By now, I think we're all quite aware of just how widespread the issue is. It's estimated that 79% of adults in Scotland and 40% of children and young people experience loneliness. Beyond the statistics, it's not difficult to think of the people in our own lives who may feel lonely or isolated. The neighbour you see once in a blue moon taking the bins out, or the lifelong family friend you really should have phoned but haven't quite got round to it yet. We live increasingly transient and busy lives. We're encouraged to live our best lives, embrace all opportunities and achieve beyond what's possible. We travel further to work. We put more onus on ourselves to tell the world that we're doing what we're doing and paint the perfect picture and rely increasingly on technology for our social interactions. 
perhaps it's not surprising that some groups of society feel more isolated than ever. Perhaps we haven't realised what the impact these changes have on us in terms of our own mental health, being present and having meaning meaningful social interactions. Increasingly, we are more aware of the fact that older people are not on the only section of society affected by loneliness. There are times in our lives where loneliness can be amplified, following the death of a loved one, a lengthy divorce, becoming a new parent, possibly alone, being a carer, or maybe during a period of ill health when it's not possible to get out and about as you'd quite like to. Young people too are affected by social isolation and loneliness. And I, as I stated in the action plan that I put out just before Christmas, this must all become a strong focus. A BBC study of over 55,000 found that loneliness is felt more intensely by young people, with two in five of people aged between 16 and 24 reporting to feel lonely often or very often. And as I have said, the role of social media in our lives is changing how we interact with people day to day. WhatsApp has replaced phoning a friend and a young professional at work in the workplace may well send an email to the office along the corridor rather than go and speak in person. And I'm very keen to see more work being done on the impact technology and social media has on young people. Interestingly though, the same study found that those who report feeling lonely had more online only friends, Facebook friends, than those who did not. So as part of the action plan that I put, I called for exploration of how pupils can be taught about loneliness and the value of social relationships as part of the curriculum. I'm pleased to hear the minister say that that was going to be happening in the future. I also called for, where possible, for pupils to be encouraged to get involved with national schemes, such as the John Muir Award and the Duke of Edinburgh, or clubs such as Scouts or the Girl Guides. Older people, however, are of course massively affected by loneliness. And across the UK, 3.6 million older people live alone, and over 2 million of them are over 75, my mum being, being one of them. And three out of four GPs say that they see between one and five people a day who have come in mainly because that they are lonely. And that's why I've also called for better use of social prescribing platforms that already exist. I recently carried out a social prescribing survey to GPs in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dumfries and Galloway. And what is clear is that the platform available to, available to them isn't up to date, it's not easily accessible or user friendly and this does need to change. It's of course not down to GPs alone. We need to have a national conversation on what simple acts of kindness we can make in our everyday lives, as well as encourage those who are lonely to ask for and accept acts of kindness when they are offered them without feeling guilt or shame. And that's why I've called for a Scotland-specific National Loneliness Day, stressing the need to have something personal to Scotland that captures people's imaginations. So will the Minister commit to supporting this day and press ahead with plans to introduce it? And when we have debates like these, I'm, off, I'm always conscious of the fact the conversation is framed in a way that doesn't necessarily celebrate what older people have to offer. Older people are absolutely an asset and having spent just one day at a contact the elderly tea party, I can honestly say I had a great time and I look forward to attending many more. And in last year's debate, I spoke a lot about intergenerational projects that had inspired me. The nursery place in an old folks, an old people's home, for example, just one of them. And I therefore asked the Scottish Government what work is being done to promote more of this kind of project. But to finish today, Deputy President Officer, I would like to reiterate my support for the national strategy. Every single day, there are charities across our communities who are making a real difference. Unfortunately, I don't have time to mention all of them. However, I was very pleased to see many charities come together last year to form the Action Group on Isolation and Loneliness. This is an extremely positive step towards improving the lives of many. Loneliness is like a ticking time bomb, which needs to be the responsibility of everyone, from government down to local communities, to make a real difference. I'm looking forward today, and I hope to see real cultural change, and I move the amendment in my name. 
I now call on Alex Rowley to speak to and move Amendment 15609.2 for six minutes, please, Mr Rowley. I thank you, President Officer. The development of a strategy for loneliness and isolation has been supported across this chamber by all parties in a number of debates over a number of years. The strategy also builds on the important work that was carried out by the Joe Cox Commission, which found that 9 million people across the UK are lonely. So in moving Labour's amendment today, I would want to give our ongoing support to this strategy. I would also want to make clear that having a strategy is important, and it is important that all levels of government, communities and civic Scotland are part of that strategy with a commitment to making it work. But it is also very clear that the current political choice of austerity in the UK is leading to more isolation and more people experiencing loneliness. It, it is time that social isolation and loneliness are recognised as a major public health issue that can have enduring and serious effects on a person's physical and mental health, and that is why we do support the government's motion. Our amendment is designed to highlight that for this strategy to work, there is a need for investment and a need to end austerity. The fact is that this strategy comes at a time when ongoing austerity is having a very real negative impact on tens of thousands of people in Scotland, on local services, on support for enabling local communities and on many third sector organisations working at the heart of communities up and down Scotland. While the strategy effectively lays out the need to build cohesive communities, improve people's mental and physical health and reduce poverty and acknowledges the important role that the third sector plays, this strategy fails to acknowledge the threat that budget cuts to social security, to public services and the third sector poses in tackling loneliness. For example, Inclusion Scotland in their brief state cuts to welfare benefits have also reduced tens of thousands of Scots disabled people's ability to participate in the wider society. They also point out that the stigma arising from political rhetoric and media coverage of welfare reform has also caused an increase in disabled people's harassment and fear of harassment. So it is crucial if we are serious about tackling loneliness and isolation that we acknowledge the impact of government policies to achieve that ambition. Labour believes that local councils, which are key to building cohesive communities, are bearing the brunt of this government's budget cuts. As the UN report noted in his report on extreme poverty and human rights, many of the public places and institutions that previously brought communities together, such as libraries, community and recreational centres and public parks, have been steadily dismantled or undermined. A briefing from the Royal Blind and Scottish Blind war blinded for today's debate states that respondents to their survey argued for more services at the local level which supported people with sight loss and brought them together provided both by local authorities and the third sector. So I would argue that the £1 million fund to support innovative projects and approaches to bring people together whilst being welcome is a drop in the ocean compared to the £319 million cut local government is facing if the government's budget passes in its current form. There is no doubt that cuts to councils will impact on the strategy. You only have to look at some of these cuts to, to see that that's a fact. Last year, Inverclyde withdrew free swimming for over 60s. Edinburgh Council's recent Budget proposals include £350,000 budget cut to Edinburgh Leisure, followed by three years of a £1 million cut to their budget. Murray Council are proposing to shut two swimming pools and libraries. Further examples of changes that could be considered by local councils to save money, which could erode people's feelings of community and opportunity, are, are, are as follows. The withdrawal of subsidy to pensioners' Christmas dinners. 
the withdrawal of subsidy to local halls, charging for attendance at adult day centres, increasing charges for meals on wheels, increasing prices and reducing an opening hours across leisure services and activities, stopping support for bus services, reducing support for local events and closing community facilities. And can I say that some of the options that I have seen being looked at by councils are horrendous. Indeed, I note the former Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government has tabled a motion in this Parliament describing the proposed cut to shop mobility in West Lothian as short-sighted and risks social isolation. I have to say there is not much point of MSPs in here lining up to attack the frontline cuts when they, the very same people, voted through those horrendous cuts onto the councils. And that really is the main point. There is a, there is a consensus in here that we need to address these issues. But the bottom line, presiding officer, is failed austerity is impacting on every community, it's impacting on local organisations that are at the hearts of the community. So if we're going to address loneliness and isolation, we have to put resources and we have to stop austerity. I call Alison Johnson, six minutes please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. It's certainly a sad paradox that we live in a society that gives us ever more means to contact one another through technology, yet many more people are feeling lonely. Um, and I, I think we should regard loneliness as a barometer of how successful our society is. Societies that are open, equal, welcoming and cohesive are, are by definition less likely to have large number of people who feel left out and alone. And I know that we are all extremely concerned that figures from NHS Health Scotland suggest that 11% of adults in Scotland often feel lonely and that almost 40% of adults sometimes do. As the Minister stressed, loneliness is a major public health problem and the strategy rightly recognises this. The medical evidence we have suggests, as we've heard, that loneliness can have a significant negative impact on our health it can carry the equivalent risk for early death as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and also increasing the risks of high blood pressure and heart disease. And many of the action plans, the, the points, the, the action points in the plan are welcome. For example, greater emphasis on social prescribing and the expansion of the community link program to more GP surgeries. All too often, and Annie Wells highlighted this, GPs are the only contact that a person might have, a, a chronically lonely patient. That might be the only contact they have. Three out of four GPs in the UK say that between one and five people a day have sought an appointment because they're lonely. And quite rightly, the Royal, the Royal College of GPs Scotland describes loneliness as a health epidemic. And I would encourage the Minister to consider some of the Royal College's proposals, including further expansion of that community links programme and longer GP appointments so that they can better assist their, their, their patients who are experiencing loneliness. And they also make some constructive suggestions around producing a quality assured national database of projects that offer the right support and ensuring that voluntary groups have reliable longer term funding, an issue that has been raised by various colleagues across the chamber. Because many of these local groups, they do incredible work. Um, I, I can think of Health All Round, a community health project based in the Gorgie Dorai Stenhouse and Stockton areas of the region I represent. Amongst a whole range of Groups, activities and events, Health All Round organises Good Morning Gorgie, a social group for older adults that meets every Tuesday morning at St Martin's Community Resource Centre in Dilray. You know, people there enjoy cooking, writing, arts and crafts. And for some members, it provides that key opportunity just to meet up for friendship and socialising, an opportunity that they might not have otherwise. Um, the minister mentioned the fabulous Bridge End Farmhouse and spoke too of the importance of placemaking. And the Hollies in Musselburgh, you know, it offers food, chat and even an affordable haircut. Um, and that, that's just off Musselburgh's busy high street. So, you know, some of these projects are well served by bus routes, of course, but others aren't. Um, and I was glad to see in the strategy a focus on transport and infrastructure because we can have these fabulous projects, but it's really important that people can access them, that they can get to them because you know, access to, to good transport can reduce loneliness and social isolation. 
A King's College London study has found that access to free bus passes is associated with a 12% decline in depressive symptoms, with the researchers suggesting that the benefits came from reduced loneliness, increased participation in volunteering activities and increased, increased contact with children and friends. In too many parts of this, the, the country, as we know, bus services are expensive, they're unreliable and they're not frequent enough. And for those who are not able to drive or, or, choo or you know, choose not to, public transport and local bus services in particular, you know, they, are, they really are a key service. So we have to, we have to make sure that, that our buses are better. And I'd like to commend the work that my colleague John Finney is leading in that regard. I'd also draw the Chamber and the Government's attention to the recent statement on poverty in the UK from Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. Mr Alston says, Transport should be considered an essential service, equivalent to water and electricity, and the Government should regulate the sector to the extent necessary to ensure that people are adequately served, abandoning people to the private market in relation to a service that affects every aspect, every dimension of their basic well-being is incompatible with human rights requirements. We also need to ensure that public places have the facilities needed for everyone to have the confidence to get out and about. Um, in particular, a lack of access to public toilets can cause people who might need urgent toilet access to avoid leaving home, and this can lead to isolation and loneliness. Um, I've brought an amendment to the planning bill to ensure that local Development plans must include a statement of the planning authority's policies regarding provision of public toilets. But I was recently contacted by a constituent who is, is happy that I share her thoughts. She works in the health sector and she spoke of the growing elderly population that we have and the growing list of health issues that affect people. And, you know, she has stressed the fact that some people simply will not leave home if they don't feel that there's somewhere they can access when they need to. Um, presiding officer, I am I'm running out of time, but I would just ask uh, the minister to respond to the points that I and others have made and look forward to working with colleagues across the chamber uh, to ensure that absolutely no one in Scotland feels lonely. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, six minutes, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I start by thanking the government for securing time for this debate and indeed for their work in this vital area. Um, they have the full support of these benches in the delivery of the strategy around loneliness and isolation. And we have had debates like this before and we will do again, but it's good that we are working towards some level of progress here. The 19th century French novel uh, de Balzac said this. He said that solitude is fine, but you always need somebody close to hand to tell you that it's fine. 65,000 Scots spent this Christmas alone. All told, 200,000 elderly Scots go half a week or more without a, a single visit or a phone call from somebody they know or care about. So for all our progress, all our advances as a society, all of our greater understanding about social inclusion, we are contracting as a society as well. We, through our online culture, people don't go to the shops like they used to. People buy things online. We are seeing the demise over Christmas of many high street names and high street stores where people may have uh, found their only human interaction in getting their messages uh, in any given day of the week. Um, with that also, we've seen the closure of local immunities, some of which have been alluded to in the debate so far, and particularly around those hubs, those social hubs in our communities, those one-stop places where people would go, like post offices or banks, where people uh, may uh, have their, their sort of weekly calendar built around their trip to the post office to draw their pension or their banks to do uh, their, their daily business. So, so too, and I wasn't even considering this until I went uh, on a visit on, about prostate cancer to a local William Hill bookmaker, but the same too is happening with bookmakers as well. With the, on -rise, uh, the rise of online gambling, we are seeing a decline in on-street bookmakers where um, particularly older men, and I don't mean to be pejorative or prescriptive there, but particularly older men would traditionally go and, and spend an afternoon, and those are being removed from our communities and with it the opportunity for social interaction. 
Can I just say also, I recognize too Alison Johnson's remarks about the inhibiting factors that we can have with people who don't have confidence in the towns and landscapes around them. Uh, toilets is a really important one, particularly people with disabilities, given the paucity of disabled uh, toilets in our, um, in our high streets and in our facilities, in our venues. Um, it, it is often a cause for people who have other cause to be isolated in the first place, not to take the decision to leave their house. But so too is there a lack of confidence in our physical on-street landscape, in the infrastructure and pavements and footpaths of our towns and cities. I have mentioned many times my desire uh, to see this government bring forward a national fall strategy. It's something that uh, this parliament has voted for twice on amendments in my name. So I would be very grateful for the Scottish government to update the chamber in their closing remarks as to where they believe we are in terms of addressing the issues of falls, by which I don't mean falls in clinical care. We have a falls framework for that, but we do need to give confidence for people that accident black spots are well gritted, have ready handrails, and that uh, there is a consideration about on-street furniture and things like that which may lend themselves to the problem that we have. Um, I also associate myself again with the remarks of Alison Johnson in terms of uh, the removal of vital public transport links. I have um, spent much of my time as an MSP receiving calls uh, and correspondence from the Barnton Care Home, which is a, a great place to visit. So there are some very uh, robust opinions in the residents that live there, but they are all, to a person all devastated by the removal of the 64 Lifeline bus service, which connected them to East Craigs and the Guile Shopping Centre. Now they have to take two buses into town and back out uh, to, to collect their messages and to visit uh, friends on that side of the city. It's uh, simple things like this which make so, um, loneliness and isolation um, become happenstance and then become the norm. So we talk a good game. And I mentioned this in my intervention to uh, the minister. We talk a good game in this chamber and, and make policy directed at reducing it, but also we make bad decisions at a local level as well as at an, a national level. And those eight organizations I met with yesterday in Muir House serve thousands of people in the most vulnerable part of my constituency and Ben McPherson's constituency in the northwest of Edinburgh. The Integrated Joint Board ran a funding bid round which saw them lose £650,000 across eight organisations in this year. That is an existential threat to each and every one of them. I, I'm quite happy to give way to Jeremy Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. Um, I, I'm grateful. I, I wonder, would you also agree with me that there's been a lack of transparency on why these organisations have lost their money. And would you agree with me that the IGB board should meet with each of the charities that have lost their money to explain what went wrong with the application? Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for Jeremy Balfour's intervention. I was coming on to exactly that. I couldn't agree more. In the conversation I had with the eight organisations who stand to lose this existential sum of money, um, the, several things became apparent. Firstly, there has been no feedback around the process, despite there being a, a vague offer of feedback. Secondly, there was a, a, a general rule that said that, we that the IJB would not fund the provision of a crash, which I intimated to the minister, and I think is in incredibly myopic. And then finally, Finally, there was the, the sort of anecdotal evidence that there was a, a view that North West Edinburgh has always been invested and in, it was time for somewhere else to get uh, a piece of the pie. Given that this is a, a, a part of my constituency which regularly features in the top five um, multiple indices of multiple deprivation in our country, it is not a time to withdraw resources from it. So I welcome the intervention. So Northwest Carers, Dry Law Neighbourhood Centre, Almond Mains, organisations like this provide a, a vital central hub for people to come together. So can I close in the time that I have remaining, uh, presiding officer, in welcoming the strategy, particularly welcoming uh, the appointment of my friend and constituent, Brian Sloan, who is the chief executive of Age Scotland, uh, to the implementation group, who will be a, a breath of fresh air and has some real innovative thinking on this. Um, and just finishing, as I started with a quote, I'll finish with one as well. And Mother Teresa famously said that the most terrible kind of poverty is loneliness. And I think that we need to uh, hold that in our thoughts as we take this agenda forward. Thank you. We move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes, please. I have a little time in hand, but please don't go over the top with that. Uh, Ruth Maguire, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, presiding officer. Social isolation and loneliness can, of course, affect anyone at any time in their life. And it's the responsibility of all of us to build a country where everyone feels welcome 
and valued in our communities. Scotland is leading the way as one of the first countries in the world to publish a national strategy on social isolation and loneliness. This strategy, backed by £1 million of investment over the next two years, is a step forward in tackling the issue. In preparing for this debate, I was struck by the call from Age UK for policymakers and researchers to be clear about the difference between loneliness and social isolation. They say on their website, loneliness is not the same as social isolation. People can be isolated, alone, yet not feel lonely. People can be surrounded by other people, yet still feel lonely. The distinction between these two concepts is often overlooked, which makes it difficult to understand what can help people reduce their feelings of loneliness. As the Minister um, said in opening, loneliness is a subjective feeling about the gap between a person's desired levels of social contact and their actual level of social contact. It refers to the perceived quality of a person's relationships. Loneliness is never desired and lessening these feelings can take a long time. Social isolation is an objective measure of the number of contacts that people have. It's about the quantity and not the quality of relationships. People may choose to have a small number of contacts and when they feel socially isolated, this can be overcome relatively quickly by increasing the number of people they're in contact with. Loneliness and social isolation are different but related concepts. Social isolation can lead to loneliness and loneliness can lead to social isolation. They're different but can be experienced at the same time. Folk may feel different levels of social isolation and loneliness over their lifetime, moving in and out of these states as their personal circumstances change. They share many factors. Uh, loneliness and is social isolation also share many factors that are associated with increasing the likelihood of people experiencing each, such as deteriorating health and sensory and mobility impairments. Indeed, Inclusion Scotland um, pointed out in their brief um, social isolation and loneliness affects a disproportionate number of disabled people at all stages of their lives, from childhood to old age. So, presiding officer, quality matters because um, bringing people together to increase the number of social contacts they have is not an end in itself. Good quality, rewarding relationships are needed to combat loneliness. The quality of relationships people have in their life matters. It's really important. There are a number of groups in my Cunningham South constituency that provide just that quality interaction. Um, I think I probably have time to mention um, one of them in particular. The Men's Shed movement um, began in Australia in 2005 and it centres on encouraging groups of men to get together around activities that you could find in a garden shed, from engineering to creative writing and everything in between all in a way that benefits their health and well-being. This concept has taken off over the last 13 years or so, and today there are 67 open sheds in Scotland and 47 in development. I'm very pleased to say that we have one in Irvine, which is based at the Scottish Maritime Museum. And I spoke to uh, Jamie, who's leading the development of the Irvine, Irvine Harborside's men's shed. And he told me um, the inspiration behind them beginning it there at the museum. He said that they currently had a dedicated um, volunteer base and many of them were men, mainly ex-engineers. And they'd often cited loneliness and social isolation as a reason for volunteering. Now, the new Men's Shed project gave them the chance to offer all men, whatever their background, the opportunity to come together and learn new skills, to become more social, to get active, and in doing so, um, improve their mental well-being. Um, a common phrase that's heard in sheds is that men don't talk face to face, they talk shoulder to shoulder whilst working or enjoying a hobby with their friends. Um, now, Jamie told me that was something that they'd observed and admired about their volunteer base and they, they hoped that that camaraderie would continue in the men's shed. Um, the Irving Group already has 20 to 30 men meeting every couple of weeks on a Thursday and I really think that that number and size of folk participating in the group is testament to the quality of experience um, that the men are having and um, friendships have been built and they socialise out with the group as well. There are demonstrable um, wider benefits to the men's shed movement. Um, so as well as supporting individuals, local communities which have sheds um, can 
and it can benefit from uh, the projects that are undertaken, things like planters being made and Wendy houses for uh, local nurseries, right through to uh, commercial bicycle refurbishment schemes. So I really look forward to seeing Irvine Harbourside benefit similarly. Presenting officer, I probably just close by saying that it, I'm proud that Scotland's leading the way with this strategy, and I look forward to hearing from everyone else about the other examples of quality groups that are going on around Scotland. Thank you. Jeremy Balfour, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also add my uh, thanks to the government for bringing forward uh, this debate uh, this afternoon. Um, I agree with the Minister that it's not just um, older people that can feel um, isolated, uh, but it's um, across different generations, uh, from the young uh, through to middle-aged uh, to through to older people. But perhaps one group that is particularly affected uh, by um, isolation um, is that of those who have a disability. Whether your disability is as a, a, a child um, or as a, a middle-aged individual or as an older person, uh, because of your disability, because that can often affect your ability to get out um, and to do things that most of us take for granted, isolation can become a real issue. I think isolation can happen perhaps less today than previous generations because of societal attitudes, because of what people will say to you or how people will react if you go out and about. Whether it's uh, to leisure centres, uh, whether it is uh, to other activities, people with disability um, often will have to think through how do they get there, what will happen when I get there, will there be the appropriate facilities when it happens. But perhaps one of the, the greatest issues around isolation and disability is that of employment. There is, as we all know still, a, a major lack of opportunity for those with disability to enter the uh, market of employment. And that is particularly true for those who have learning difficulties. Um, and all the statistics tell us, and, and I point no blame at the government for this, but all the statistics tell us that things are still not improving here in Scotland, or in fact, across the rest of the United King Kingdom. And I do believe that if we are going to tackle this issue of isolation and employment, for those with disability, we need to do some radical thinking. Uh, yesterday um, afternoon, I had uh, the privilege of attending Garvold workshop on Gorgi Road here in Edinburgh. Garvold is uh, basically um, a, an Edinburgh charity working with those, particularly with learning difficulties, but with other disabilities across Edinburgh and the Lothian. The workshop in Edinburgh is a remarkable place, and if uh, Minister is looking for a visit, I could highly recommend it to her. Not only do you get um, an excellent lunch, which obviously is important, but you get to see how the bread is made, how uh, chairs are made, how woodwork is done. And this is real employment, giving people real opportunities to learn new skills. But perhaps as important, it gives them an opportunity to build friendships and relationships and to be able to integrate with people who they work with, and people who are supporting them. It is um, a project that has been going uh, for over 20 years now. But as I was talking to some of the individuals, they were saying to me, you know, we can only stay here sometimes for one or two years, because after that, the council take away our funding. They, should, they say to us, this should be a stepping stone into proper employment. I'm tempted to say to the council officers, how long have you been at the council for? Should you be moved on after two years? This totally misunderstands what Garvard are trying to do. They're trying to teach people who, let us be honest, would find it very difficult to get into mainstream employment. But they are teaching them skills, they're giving them opportunities, and they're giving them opportunities not to be isolated, but to socialize. And if we are radically going to think how people do employment or work opportunities to break isolation, then we've got to get rid of this mindset 
that organisations such as Garwood and others across Scotland are simply a stepping stone to pushing trolleys in Tesco's or other types of jobs. And it angers me that we've still got a mindset within some of our council offices across Scotland that this is the way forward. Deputy President, officer, we want this to be, I think, a consensual debate. But if I can just finish with one other point, picking up on uh, Alex Cole Hamilton's. Because it's not just organisations within his constituency that have been affected by this. It's organisations across the whole of Lothian. I, the IGB here in Edinburgh has slashed funding for many community activities. One <coughs> working in Craig Miller is the Community Ability Network. It works with older people and disabled people, one to deal with social, social isolation, but also to help them in regard to their benefits and in regard to getting a proper access to different services. At the end of March in this year, just in what, six or seven weeks' time, that organisation will close because of what the IJB has done. I know another organisation in Vesselvig, which deals with older people, gives them um, lunches for people that are isolated, that will close in December. They are only going on for another nine months because of um, the reserves that they have. The decisions by IGB are not affecting, they are affecting organisations, but perhaps more importantly, they are affecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And so I would also welcome if the Minister would look at these issues. I appreciate uh, some of her hands are tied, but I would welcome a meeting with her as well, perhaps along with Alex Cole Hamilton, to see what Scottish Government can do to help these organisations. Yes, we all want to see isolation stopped across the generations. But if organisations such as IJB are cutting funding, then this will never happen. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Fulton McGregor, followed by Mark Griffin. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. As others have said, Scotland is one of the first countries in the world to publish a national strategy on social isolation and loneliness. And this is something that we should all welcome. And I am certainly proud to be in a country that puts focus in this area. Because social isolation and loneliness can affect anyone at any point in their life. And this strategy is a step forward in tackling this issue. One in 10 people in Scotland report feeling lonely often. And this figure is probably considerably, considerably underreported as many people may feel afraid to admit that they feel lonely. Social isolation can have a significant impact on both physical and mental health. And I welcome the Scottish Government announcement made today by the Minister that to deal with uh, loneliness as a public health issue and the, the news that the Connected Scotland strategy will invest £1 million over the next two years. But importantly, President Officer, I think that the key message from the Minister in her opening statement was that we must all remember that tackling loneliness is a responsibility of all of us, all agencies, organisations, communities and individuals. And it's not simply about money. And perhaps not surprisingly, I want to focus my remarks here on some of the good work happening in my constituency to address the issue. Presiding officer, social isolation and loneliness affects a disproportionate number of disabled people at all stages of their life. And research demonstrates that disabled children and young people often have limited opportunity to access leisure activities, often due to bullying or that bullying spoiling access to inclusive activities or, or using leisure eh, and recreation facilities. The Shining Stars and Additional Support Needs Theatre School was established in my constituency in Coatbridge in 2016 with the aim of overcoming such disadvantage and to provide the opportunity for young people with additional support needs ranging from mild to severe to come together to develop confidence and life skills whilst participating in a number of activities including drama, musical theatre, dance and arts therapy. And the Shining Stars have gained a local reputation as a trusted and respected organisation and they recently secured a permanent home within the constituency which will allow for the development such as a sensory room and a bespoke facilities to improve the learning experiences of its members. And I'm uh, personally looking forward to uh, going out and visiting the new premises and not to be uh, outdone by Jeremy Balfour. I'm sure the Minister, if she had time, would be very welcomed by um, uh, Katie Slavin and the Shining Stars team there too. 
And there are many other uh, local organisations besides the Officer who tackle isolation and loneliness for our young people. Um, and I couldn't possibly mention them all, but I'll briefly mention iSkate, which was formed in 2013 by parents and volunteers whose aims were to develop skating for people who were disabled or mobility impaired by offering a range of opportunities, including a programme that, enable, that, that allows all to train and participate in competitions and events on an equal basis. But I do want to say um, that, that why it's important that all public bodies, including, for example, leisure trusts, uh, must make their services access accessible to all. And um, people in the chamber may be aware that um, just prior to Christmas there, I, I started a petition um, to save the time capsule um, water uh, park complex in Coatbridge after there was concerns that it would, um, that its opening hours would be reduced just to weekends where it would be more um, you know, suitable just uh, for, for, for mainstream children and this um, caused a bit of outrage. I have had uh, reassurances from the, the, the Leisure Trust that uh, they, they will not be, be doing that and that the, the, the pool will be staying open um, after refurbishments at the enhanced hours. However, I would ask them to go one stage further and, um, and go back to, to previous existing hours um, you know, where, where it's open during the day as well. And I think that can be more accessible. Presiding officer, another area I think it's also important to consider uh, in loneliness and in the context of addiction. Um, as I've said in this chamber before, this is a big issue in my constituency and something I think we need to really t uh, tackle head on. Um, I, you know, I'll make mention of one good organisation in my constituency, uh, Reach Advocacy. Um, I know that they're also, they're also known to the, to the Minister. I'm aware that, that very recently they applied to the National Development Fund and were unsuccessful. However, um, I was pleased to hear that they were successful with the Scottish Recovery Consortium. Um, but my understanding is that that, that that means they'll be more based on a national basis and not a local issue. And I think that the, from the information that I've got, that the, the reasons why um, they, they, they weren't successful in the initial fund was due to a lack of business plan and the the, the, the North, Lan uh, North Lanarkshire Alcohol and Drug Partnership not being fully established. And I think that for um, serious about tackling uh, loneliness and all agencies working together and everybody playing their role, then we maybe need to look be behind these uh, bureaucratic def uh, deficiencies that are there as well. Presiding officer, uh, you know, the Age Scotland uh, research that 100,000 older people in Scotland say they feel lonely all or most of the time is, uh, is, a, is a big wake up call to everybody. Um, I'm overwhelmed by the work that uh, I see in my constituency every day in addressing loneliness and social isolation in, uh, in the older people group. Muirhead and District Seniors Forum are one great example of that and they were deserving recipients of an Age Scotland Inspiration Award for their work in supporting and encouraging the over 55 age group and engaging in social activity. Uh, and also the, the Nifty Fifties based in Coatbridge, uh, like all the other organisations that I've mentioned, have had the pleasure of going out and visiting. They're absolutely fantastic. And I want to also make a special mention of um, one of our councillors, because I think that uh, often they, they, they don't get the praise they deserve. Uh, and here, Councillor Caroline Stephen, when she worked in partnership with the Safety Zone based in Burgedy, uh, and set up a, a special Christmas lunch, uh, brought together various older people's groups in the area, and it was, it was said to be an absolutely fantastic success, uh, where new friendships were made uh, and, uh, and established. And I know that there's another one uh, planned for next year, which is going to be even bigger and better. Presiding officer, I'll conclude on that very nice point, and I, I welcome uh, the, the motion put forward by the, by the Minister today. Thank you very much. Mark Griffin, followed by Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Last year, we supported the launch of the government's draft strategy. It was desperately needed and a first step to start tackling the issue. And as I said then, it's reassuring that social isolation, increasingly a social and public health epidemic, is one area all parties are agreed that action is needed. Now, this revised strategy put together following consultation to which people responded saying that cuts to public services mean communities alone cannot tackle loneliness is another step forward. I had hoped, however, that it might meet, lead to a more constructive and cost-cutting focus on how we use resources to tackle isolation and loneliness. And though the Minister accepts in the strategy forward that the government has an important role in tackling these issues, the mantra that biggest impact can only be delivered if we enable communities themselves to play their part has been trotted out again. But the simple fact is that a £1 million um, fund to implement the strategy will do little to recoup the much-loved services and activities communities are losing right now. Alex Rowley mentioned some of those. 
Three um, over 60s swimming withdrawn in Inverclyde. £350,000 cut from Edinburgh Leisure. Libraries and swimming pools could be closed in Murray. While North Lanarkshire Council in, in my region have cut £230 million over the last 10 years because of government cuts to their grant, and that has devastated services. I'd be interested to hear how the government believes the latest budget, slashing £319 million from services, will enable communities to play their part. Because the answer is that they won't. More cuts will only dismantle and undermine the services that keep communities together. President officer, Joe Cox's groundbreaking commission on loneliness sought to tackle the issue before many other politicians had even considered it. On behalf of the, the Labour family, we are grateful that, though she's no longer with us, that her work is still making the world a better place, and that's recognised in the document. Across the UK, loneliness harms 9 million people, and its consequences cost the economy £32 billion every year. In Scotland, loneliness affects almost half of adults, often or occasionally. 80% of carers feel lonely, and three in 10 calls to Silverline Scotland and to the National LGBT Helpline are about loneliness. And those trends should fill us with dread, and they should also drive us to tackle the root causes. Our amendment today recognises the UN Rapporteur's comments about the dismantling of vital services being at the root of increase in poverty, because that poverty intersects with the issue of loneliness we're debating today. And people don't just want a strategy, they want the resources and services to tackle the poverty that plagues communities. They want to grow their own bonds and curb loneliness. And that's why on Thursday, we will be voting against the budget that will serve up more austerity-driven cuts to local authorities. Before I close, President Officer, I want to pick up on that point I touched on before that 80% of carers feel lonely. Now, with powers over social security, we should use them to help people overcome that loneliness. As I said in the, the debate last year, a disability in a family can cause loneliness through financial, emotional and practical pressures. Stigma and lack of suitable services prevent families from being integrated while low income restricts the freedom to get out and about. Loneliness, loneliness is something that I referenced in the, the recent members debate we had here on end of life care. And I discussed that regularly with carer and support organizations. And since last summer, I've been asking them how we can change carer's allowance. And one of the decisive responses is that access to concessionary travel for carers would help them boost their personal incomes, allow them to get out and about and cut through some of the isolation and loneliness they face. And when it comes to disability entitlements, we can tackle loneliness too. Over the summer, I, I hosted a, a roundtable discussion with over 30 third sector stakeholders, academics and disabled people. And a very simple message coming out of that session was that the mobility component must be extended to those on attendance allowance. Um, it's the fair thing to do in terms of equalities, and I would hope that as the Minister for Older People that um, she would certainly take that up with the Cabinet Secretary. But as one person at that meeting said, gone are the days when older people, disabled or not, want to retire stuck at home. They want to get out and the social security system should support that too. And if we're truly building a system based on dignity and respect, I hope that we can assure disabled people that the social security system will help them get into their communities and improve their health, regardless of their age. And that new um, system can be a catalyst for reversing isolation caused by personal financial troubles. And I, I hope the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security will consider further how the, the new system tracks, measures and overcomes social isolation. Thank you, President Officer. Sandra White, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you very much, President Officer. I, I, I think it's a fantastic debate today. I'm sorry that some parties, particularly the Labour Party, choose to politicise it. Uh, basically, I think we should be celebrating the fact that we have this strategy. And, and I really feel great being able to say 
uh, thank you to the Minister for Older People. Uh, it's something that uh, myself and others in this Parliament have pushed for for years and years. So welcome, Minister for Older People and Equalities, and I'm pleased that you've managed to secure this debate today. I think it's been said by many others that um, loneliness and isolation is not just deemed to be for older people. And the Minister mentioned the previous uh, Equality Committee, which I was Deputy Convener on, and we did do an inquiry into loneliness, and indeed it did throw up issues where younger people, quite successful younger people even, we had a phone in, and uh, a young man in particular phoned in. He was working, but he'd had a, a breakup in his personal life, and all he did was go to his work and go home. But the stigma uh, to mention to other young men in, in his workplace, <clears throat> he never got to that. So basically all he had in his life was to go to work, come home, and he was lonely and he was isolated too, and it was affecting his health. So, I mean, I do welcome Annie Wells' uh, amendment in regards to, uh, you know, including um, younger people also. It affects everyone from every walk of life, uh, loneliness and isolation. And that's why I'm very pleased to, to be speaking in this debate today. And also, as we mentioned before, the, the strategy. I mean, when you think about it, and this is where we should actually be, you know, not so much patting ourselves on the back, but be proud of this parliament. It's, Scotland is one of the first, one of the first countries in the world to publish a national strategy in social isolation and loneliness. And I think that's something to be proud of, presiding officer. I have, as I said, already mentioned about the fact about loneliness and isolation affecting every age group, and sometimes it's every economic group also in that respect. But as convener of the cross-party group in older people age and ageing, which is for 55 years upwards, so it's not that old, um, I do want to focus on some of the groups in my constituency who give, you know, of their time, but also help older people as well. And one of the ones which I think is the longest running one anyway, uh, since 1948, it's uh, called the Glasgow's Golden uh, Generation, and that's a leading charity for elderly people in Glasgow. But it was established in 1948, and it was called Glasgow's Old People's Welfare Association. And I want to thank Sheena Glass and all of the people associated way, way back then, and the people who are coming forward now. now they've been very successful in getting grants and lottery money also. And with the new name of Glasgow's Golden Generation, they're uh, celebrating 70 years, 70 years of serving older adults in Glasgow. <clears throat> now, it's not just the fact that they you know, go into people's houses, they befriend. They give advice as well. We have the befriending service, the phone calls, people pop in. They can give advice with welfare benefits, uh, you know, pinpoint them to go to certain areas. I think it was, I think it was Annie Wells as well that mentioned the deep end practices where perhaps could help, you know, against loneliness. But the, the golden generation go into people's houses, they pinpoint them to certain services that they can actually use. And I think that's something which is great. People need to know about things. We've heard uh, from everyone here uh, about the different groups that they have in their constituency, and I'm also speaking about that. But, you know, sometimes we have all these groups, but there's no register of them. And I don't know if that would be something that perhaps the minister might want to look at or pick up, but locally there's no register of them, and nationally there's no register. And we had a meeting, the last meeting we had with the cross-party group and older people. This was raised because there was so much help out there and help for people who volunteered as well as got the volunteering, but nobody knew what the other person was doing. So I think it's something that perhaps we would want to look at. But as I said, I mean, the Glasgow Gold Generation is something that we're very, very proud of indeed. Another uh, organisation which I've been there since the very beginning, 1987, uh, is the Annex Communities, which is based in Partick. Now, they actually have, you know, blossomed, basically, and they actually give support throughout the city and not just in party. But they started their life as a community uh, association, party community association, in April 1987. And basically, it was mainly residents and people that wanted to help out, etc. And in those days, uh, we were sort of a swimming in the dark type thing, trying to get, you know, various uh, organisations and grants, etc. Pardon me. But we didn't give in and uh, we pushed forward. And it was mostly set up basically to help or, or support people who, you know, in poverty or poor health, not necessarily for older people or loneliness and isolation at the start. 
but they were awarded big lottery funding, the Annex Connects project, and that actually is for people, older people there as well, uh, the elderly over 60 carers, and they do a fantastic job, and I've spoke about them many, many times, they're probably fed up with me speaking about them, but they do a fantastic job. And the minutes that I've got, the well, seconds I've got left, I wanted to mention a new, a new kid on the block, as you might say, and it's a weekday wow factor which uh, has, as I, th I think I've said before, I've mentioned to, to colleagues, they have daytime discos. Uh, they go sailing. It's fantastic. And I've been to them. And if the minister wanted to come along, I'm sure Paz and the group uh, and party, they have a disco in the Sanctuary nightclub, uh, which is during the day. And I've participated, and I can tell you it's great. So thanks very much for you know indulging me in seeing what's happening in my constituency. And I look forward to hearing what others have in their constituency. Thank you for signing off. Sir. Alexander Stewart, followed by Alistair Allen. So I'm delighted to be taking part in this afternoon's debate on tackling loneliness and social isolation. And I welcome the publication from the Scottish Government strategy uh, because this is an extremely important issue. Unfortunately, loneliness is becoming all the more common across Scotland. And we've already heard this afternoon from Annie Wells, who talks about us having to all play our part and that we need a change in culture. Well, this strategy will go some way to addressing that. While loneliness is more often associated with the elderly population, it can affect people of all ages. A report by Age UK suggested that 40% of 16 to 24-year-olds uh, fell into that category. Now, that's a huge percentage of 40% of these young people who feel that they are isolated and they feel that they are lonely. The impact of health and well-being on those affected can be significant and particularly can lead to different risks in their health. Uh, they can suffer depression, they can suffer anxiety, uh, and they can suffer dementia. And, and that has a negative impact on, on what they can achieve and what they can do. Therefore, it's vitally important uh, that we support these individuals. And it can also have a wider implication on the sustaining of our health service as well. Age Scotland estimates that loneliness and its association health conditions cost the NHF £12,000 per person per year. £12,000 per person per year, Deputy Presiding Officer, is a huge sum of money. A fact that the survey by the Royal College of uh, Practitioners published in May last year found that three out of four GPs saw between one and five patients per day who were suffering uh, from loneliness or isolation. It's very clear that there are some positive steps that can be taken to deliver better outcomes for individuals affected while reducing costs. And we've also heard this afternoon about community events and community involvement and things like the community toilets not being part and parcel can, can add to individuals having fear and anxiety about going out when they can't uh, get these facilities. Social prescription is one of the best ways of achieving these objectives uh, and I'm glad to see that the Scottish Government have committed to invest in the Community Link Worker Programme. The work of the Community Links is high level and that requires and gives opportunity for individuals and patients to meet with and to get some access. And I have seen that, Deputy Presiding Officer, across my own region, across Perth and Kinross, in Fife, in Stirling and Clackmannanshire. There are opportunities for these links uh, to take place and individuals have the opportunity to go to clubs and events uh, and that is extremely successful. Uh, but we've also heard today about some budgetary implications that have impacts on that and we have to be live to those as well. These appointments that people have take much longer time and it gives individuals the chance to have conversations, to talk about their social, their emotional and their practical needs. Furthermore, it's a great potential to see that the third sector organisations are working collaboratively with organisations to do all they can, but they also have opportunities uh, to deal with funding crises that we have. Jeremy Balfour spoke uh, eloquently about disabled individuals and the difficulties that they face. Uh, I know from my experience dealing with adults with learning difficulties and the organisations I was involved in before I became a parliamentarian, that that's vitally important. They should feel included, they should feel supported, and Individuals and organisations can do that, but they have to work collaboratively to achieve the goals. To this end, it's vitally important that we have some relationships and organisations can feel empowered. 
However, I would say that the Scottish Government have a very noble task when they're looking at community link workers, but only 56 uh, community link workers so far have been deployed, and we're expecting much more, up to 250 by the end of the parliamentary term. So the, it's important that we think about what we're doing with these uh, and ensure that every area has that opportunity. The UK Government has also been seeking to tackle this issue uh, of loneliness and has launched its first loneliness strategy in October of last year, which featured heavily on social prescribing. It talks about enabling GPs to, ha to have longer uh, involvement with individuals, for individuals to be actively in talking about walking clubs, cookery classes, arts. Uh, all of these give people the chance to develop their potential as they get older. Uh, and the funding of all these is vitally important. And we've seen, as we've already heard, community cafes, community art space, community gardens. They are working very, very well across many parts of our community. And it's vitally important that we see that. In addition, the Minister for Sport and Civil Society in the UK government has also ensured that there's a remit uh, that's cross-government loneliness. Uh, and the whole idea about cross-government uh, and cross-portfolio is vitally important. The Minister acknowledged that herself this afternoon, that there needs to be an understanding between different parts of the government so that we're all working together to achieve the goals that we want to see. Moreover, I should like to think that there is a real success uh, when it comes to talking about the coalition of nurseries uh, and old people's homes. We've seen some of that happening across the community. That's intergenerational projects, and they're working extremely well. We must also look at the innovation that's taking place with loneliness across the poor. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the issue of uh, social inclusion and loneliness is a real public health concern and one that we must work together across this chamber to tackle urgently. Further investment in social uh, participation is vitally important, but we have to think about what the consequences are at some times. And we've heard about joint interboards this afternoon that are causing some difficulty to some societies and some organisations all of that here today and we have a role to play ourselves as parliamentarians to ensure that we raise awareness of this issue uh, it's more general and that individuals pay their part because every individual in our community deserves our support and nobody should feel lonely and isolated thank you thank you very much mr stewart i call alistair allen to be followed by mary fee mr allen please Presiding officer, uh, most people, whether uh, or not they care to admit it, will have experienced loneliness at some stage in their lives. What's shocking, however, and other members have referred to this, uh, is the figures produced by the Our Voice Citizen panel uh, showing that one in 10 Scots say they often feel lonely. More troubling for me still, however, is the evidence that 22% of Scots say they don't feel they have a strong sense of belonging to their community. Uh, I suspect that these are figures which are replicated or problems which are replicated elsewhere throughout the Western world, but they are disturbing to read. Not long ago, I met with an organisation called Befriending Lewis, an organisation in my constituency which does outstanding work with people who feel isolated or in need of friendship. What struck me most was the sheer variety of people who become isolated. And I should, of course, be clear here that they didn't describe actual individuals to me, but broad categories of people. Some of these categories were the ones I expected to hear about. Older people whose families had moved away from the island, people without a car who relied either on a very infrequent bus service or on the kindness of neighbours to get them out of the house, people suffering from illnesses or bereavement or who had simply lived longer than most of their close friends and all problems exacerbated in very many cases uh, by living several miles from the nearest shops. But the other groups they mentioned surprised me and other members have alluded to this already today. It's clear from around the country that many of those experiencing loneliness are in fact young people. Now, it's both tempting and simplistic just to blame the digital world for social isolation. In fact, getting older people online can often prove to be a transformative experience in terms of keeping them in touch with other people. But all of that said, there is, I believe, a growing recognition now um, that for all the manifold benefits of the social media, they do come with certain potential difficulties. And this is becoming true and obvious even in tight-knit island communities where um, for many people who know each other, it would still be considered formal, verging on coldly unfriendly to knock on the front door before entering someone else's house. But as Annie Wells pointed out, across the country, 
Um, we now have more and more anecdotal evidence that some of um, the very young people who have thousands of friends online can often feel uncertain about where to begin in terms of maintaining friendships offline. Uh, people who feel lonely in this way are then bombarded with images of everyone else at their happiest. Facebook post after Facebook post shows people on holiday, getting married, showing off their new friends, taking pictures of what they are eating on their works night out, sharing their innermost and sometimes fairly ill thought through feelings, uh, looking their best, having fun. Algorithms ensure that social media essentially tells us what we want to hear and shuts out new or different types of people who may live literally next door to us. And the indication is that people are using their phones less and less now actually to speak on. So that many younger people are reporting becoming wary about phoning far less visiting a friend. In fact, most of us are now unwittingly guilty of imagining that we have been keeping in touch with a friend when we have not. If we have liked enough of a friend's posts on Facebook in the course of a year, uh, we think we have kept in touch. And all of this is before we consider the misguided and in many cases actively dangerous decision of many people to judge their lives against those of celebrities, something I personally find it much harder to recall ever having done, I admit. But it is nonetheless a reality. And it is, of course, a much quoted African saying that it takes a village to raise a child. And this is undoubtedly true. But we have to consider some difficult questions here. What if a, a young person has been brought up in the belief that their village or their town is a place where they shouldn't be speaking to anyone else they see? These are huge questions we've not yet got answers to as a culture. The answer, however, is not to pretend that the digital world is going away or even to blame it for loneliness per se. The immediate answer can only be to build up real communities wherever we find them in Scotland and finding new ways of engaging everyone who finds themselves feeling outside of those communities. And that means investing in a strategy against loneliness as it's very welcome to see the Scottish Government doing with its £1 million commitment to back up uh, that strategy on tackling loneliness uh, connected Scotland. But some of it, however, and, and members have alluded to this today, it is also about a much broader investment in every aspect of our social, economic and cultural life. It means getting people outside and sometimes getting them offline, it should be said. It means mobilising the existing wonderful communities that we have up and down Scotland and the goodwill that exists in organisations like Befriending Lewis to ensure that nobody in Scotland should feel alone. Thank you very much. I call Mary Fee to be followed by Emma Harper. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate. Young or old, loneliness doesn't discriminate. It is something that many of us could easily help with. The words of Joe Cox serve as a reminder to all of us to care for one another, regardless of circumstances. And the strategy A Connected Scotland is an important piece of work that the Scottish Government should be commended for. And in 2016, Scottish Labour committed itself to a national loneliness strategy. And I do hope that the ambitions of the government's strategy are realised. However, we must acknowledge, as Scottish Labour has in our amendment, that the many public services required to tackle such problems need appropriate funding and appropriate resourcing. And Deputy Presiding Officer, councils across Scotland of all colours are in the process of calculating budgets and bracing themselves for further cuts. And local authorities are the key drivers in building cohesive communities. They cannot do so in the face of continued austerity. And since 2011, council budgets have been cut by 1.5 billion. And if the 2019-2020 budget passes as proposed, then councils face an additional 319 million in cuts. The one, pound, the one million fund to accompany this strategy is therefore the equivalent of having a cup of water to use when your house is on fire. And Deputy Presiding Officer Alex Rowley and his contribution reminded me of my time as a councillor 
and the Christmas lunches that I was um, invited to every year for the older people in, in my community. And I was normally invited to four or five Christmas lunches. And it was a great opportunity for older people to get together, to have a nice lunch. Father Christmas came along, we danced, we sang. It, it was a lovely afternoon. The local authority stopped the funding to the majority of clubs in, in the area. So they had to stop the Christmas lunches. They had to stop the Monday afternoon tea dances. And they had to stop the bus runs in the summer that the older people went on. And the impact of those cuts was absolutely devastating in the communities in the area that I represented. Many, many people only ever socialised when they went to the tea dance on a Monday, or they went on the bus run, or they went for their Christmas lunch. And we know that the solutions to tackling the effect of isolation and loneliness come from all areas and from all levels of government, working in partnership with health services and with the third sector. These solutions cannot be delivered without the necessary funding and resourcing. And Deputy Presiding Officer, it is important that the strategy, as it has done, recognises the impact isolation and loneliness has on mental health, on people of all ages and of all backgrounds. Isolation and loneliness can lead to greater levels of depression and anxiety. And those with poor mental health are at a greater risk of isolation and of loneliness. And I welcome the focus on mental health throughout this strategy and the path we are all on in increasing the importance of mental health. And that is the right, one to do, the right thing to do. Concerning children and young people, statistics show us that more children and young people are feeling socially isolated. And it would be simplistic to blame that on the rise of accessible technology and on social media. We must also acknowledge that lack of opportunities to play and the significant pressure on young people these days will play as big a role as social media and technology. And developing greater resilience for children and young people to lessen the impact of social isolation, which is caused by technology and social media, is paramount. Generation before today's never experienced this issue. We must come at this from a better understanding and knowledge on the impact of social media and mental health. And I support the ambition of the Scottish Government to build links with wider mental health policy and support work to tackle the health inequalities faced by the LGBT community. LGBT people are one of the groups identified at greater risk of social isolation and loneliness. And this is backed up by the statistics showing a third of calls to the National LGBT Helpline in the second half of 2016 were from LGBT people experiencing loneliness and social isolation. And recent Stonewall Scotland statistics showed that LGBT people were at a greater risk of poor mental health and faced discrimination from some healthcare staff. And coupling the statistics from Stonewall Scotland and the information contained within the strategy shows we need to play place a particular focus on improving the mental health of LGBT people to tackle social isolation and loneliness and vice versa. And reducing stigma around loneliness and social isolation, especially when involving mental health, requires a substantial cultural change. We have come a long way in, in recent years in changing attitudes around mental health, but we know we still have a long way to go. This strategy is an important tool in reducing the stigma, and I support any initiative which would achieve this. And in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to repeat my support for this strategy, but repeat my concerns that the goodwill of the words contained can only be achieved by the ambition to properly fund our local authorities and our third sector partner partners. Otherwise, the health and social inequalities linked to social isolation and loneliness will only grow. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Emma Harper to be followed by Maurice Corey. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this afternoon's debate on social isolation and loneliness, which, as the motion states, can affect anybody at any stage, any age or walk of life. 
And I, too, am pleased to see the publication of a Connected Scotland document backed by a million pounds of Scottish Government investment, which is set to support innovative approaches to bringing people together and in so doing, working to reduce social isolation and loneliness across our communities. I've really enjoyed the contributions so far this afternoon, and I'd like to focus my time on some of the projects in my rural South Scotland region which are working with people at risk of social isolation and loneliness, such as retired farmers and retired agricultural workers and elderly people in remote and rural areas. And I've been really impressed by the activity across the region so far to address and ensure that the appropriate support is put in place to make sure people are able to be part of their community. Presiding officer, farmers and our agricultural workers across Scotland are a group at risk of isolation due to the large number of hours spent working outside and often alone. One project I have been following and supporting, which seeks to address the health and wellbeing issues facing the agricultural community in the Dumfries and Galloway area, is the Health and Wellbeing in the Farming Community Project. The project is a joint approach between NFU Scotland, Dumfries and Galloway Health and Social Care Partnership, and the Friesen Galloway Council, and it aims to ensure that rural voices are heard and aims to gain a better understanding of the barriers, concerns and issues facing the community in becoming integrated and further connected to the wider region. It is currently taking forward action to work towards reducing social isolation and loneliness, as well as to reduce the stigma around some of the mental health conditions that social isolation and loneliness can lead to. An action plan is being developed to address the issues that were identified from a lack of farming social groups to people not knowing who to turn to when they feel that they may be, I guess, depressed or isolated and feeling lonely. And poor connectivity in terms of broadband or increased travel in rural areas is also a factor which has been mentioned by others across the chamber. And plans are now being put in place, including mental health training and awareness, to continue the Dumfries and Galloway Retired Farmer Social Group, working with all the members of the group, men and women, to support their continued engagement with each other. I would therefore like to ask the Scottish Government, as well as other local authorities, to monitor the work of the Retired Farmers Group, as their work has been requested in areas across England as well, because of the success that they have shown in promoting social integration with this retired group. Presiding Officer, another initiative also tying into health and well-being in the farming community is the Farmers and Farmers Wives Choir, with musical director input from D&G constituent Kate Picken. The choir was formed in 2013 and has more than 160 members and has performed at the Hydro in Glasgow as well as at a number of agricultural events and other events across Scotland. It's not just farmers and farmers' wives that are part of the group, there are many people across the region that uh, have joined the choir and attend. And the aim of the choir is to raise funds to donate to charities and raise awareness of mental health and social isolation in rural areas. So far, they have raised about £31,500 since 2014 in their singing across Scotland. And uh, just last Sunday night, I attended a concert by the choir in Carlisle. And I would encourage anyone to download their track on iTunes called Carry You Home as it is a, a great way to raise funds and continue to provide support for other different charities. And I'm sure me members across chamber will be happy to welcome the choir because I have invited them to the parliament to sing in the near future. And I'm sure we will all feel good once we hear them singing because uh, as well as joining in um, the choir are fantastic. Presiding Officer, priority three of the Connected Scotland document talks about the need to create opportunities for people to connect. And research from the Connected Scotland report has suggested that one of the barriers to people socially connecting is a lack of awareness about the opportunities in communities to take part in activities that are enjoyable and that create opportunities to build meaningful relationships through the pursuit of shared interest. Signposting people to groups and support available was highlighted at an NHS Transforming Wigdenshire event that I attended. Many people don't know what's out there to help support them, and I think signposting is a way that we should be able to support people out there. 
I'm interested in this because across the Fries and Galloway and the South West Scotland, there's a wide range of third sector, sector organisations working for social inclusion. And while I don't have time to talk about them all, I would like to briefly mention a couple. Incredible edibles in Stranraer and in Dumfries have volunteers that grow edible plants across public spaces in DNG, allowing people to come together and socialise and get active outdoors while learning about growing fruit and vegetables. And the men's shed at Dalbiti and Noble Hill allows for the men to come together and connect and utilise the skills that they have, mending bicycles, picture framing, painting and wood turning. And this was expertly described by my colleague Ruth Maguire earlier when she provided even more detail. And it reminds me that I have a bike that I need to drop off to the men's shed in Noble Hill as well. Mallory House and Mallory Daycare in Dumfries take the wains to Cumberland Day Centre and allow for intergenerational integration. And that is a joy to witness when you see the young folk and the elderly um, wains together. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome the positive steps the Scottish Government has taken to reduce social isolation and loneliness. And I would encourage the government to continue to work with groups across my South Scotland region and potentially look at some of them with a view to a wider rollout as an example of good practice across Scotland. Thank you. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Corrie is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Mr Corrie, please. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Social isolation is not, there's no small matter and is thankfully one of which Scotland, the Swedish Government is keenly aware. This issue is causing not only individual suffering, but strikes at the health of our communities. And now is the time to act. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree with Alistair Allen and have younger people use phones more. I keep telling my son and daughters likewise, constantly. Uh, I welcome the Connected Scotland report, which outlines key priorities for combating this country's growing social isolation and loneliness. And I commend the organizations that devote their time and countless hours to researching and combating these issues and their causes then and now. As a parliament, it is more important than ever to prevent social isolation and ensure that the well-being of those who elected us, and especially those most susceptible to loneliness, including armed forces, veterans, families, and nearly everyone who has experienced, experienced a change in life at one point or another. And in short, that includes all of us. As the research shows, from adolescents to pensioners, the key to combating social isolation is prevention. And from crisis intervention to crisis averted. And I have the example of a RAF Battle of Britain pilot, a Spitfire pilot in my area, who was befriended only two weeks before he died, having lost his wife earlier, uh, one year earlier. Situations like this are unacceptable, and there is more that can be done in coordination to prevent this happening. And though the Parliament is unable to prevent all of life's tragedies, surely we can do more to empower communities and, as individuals, do our part to end such unavoidable. Uh, avoidable tragedies. Sadly, communities are drifting apart and the number of people living alone is on the increase. Only one quarter of adults feel involved in their local community and by investing in current and future socialization projects, we can actively fight isolation. <clears throat> I welcome the report's recommendation on community involvement and encourage us to work with local councils to find best practices on this front. And a fine example of progress is in my area, in Helensborough Lomond, where Grey Matters it was set up many years ago, where they meet weekly with 70 senior citizens on a Saturday morning and gather in the Scout Hall to discuss issues affecting them personally and collectively and trying to offer solutions and apart from the chat they have. And I would encourage also the Minister to come and visit Grey Matters in the Scout Hall in Helensborough, which will be the third one today. So you're full of invitations, Minister. I now want to highlight prevention. Prevention is especially key at life's traditional periods, and veterans by nature of profession face a unique transition. Returning to non-military life is difficult, and without preparation, some families find themselves caught in between lifestyles. And a 2017 survey found that nearly one-third of ex-service personnel felt lonely or isolated. Thankfully, there are 230 military charities that often have breakfast clubs and other meetups to connect veterans with each other and their community. And this is especially important where veterans have PTSD and other life-changing issues from their military service and operational service overseas. Last week, I met with one of these charities, Bravehand, an organization which helps train uh, dogs for veterans. And one veteran spoke glowingly of how training her dog and had significantly improved her life and renewed her sense of purpose. 
Having a constant canine companion helped her feel less lonely. And nevertheless, there is still need for brave hound dogs to be allowed into premises over, throughout Scotland and not be prohibited as happens at the moment. And organizations like Brave Hound should, uh, like brave hound should allow veterans to stay con uh, connected with those in similar situations long after the military service is over. And similarly, with another uh, Brave Hound veteran with whom I attended his MOD disability pension review panel this morning here in Edinburgh, which was, I'm glad to say, successful, to see how essential it was for the review board to understand the effects on him after his operational tours of the Royal Engineers bomb disposal team in Garajda in Bosnia with the UN forces in the 1990s. He is now struggling with life today, but nevertheless, he's grateful to his brave hound dog, which has saved him from suicide on several occasions when he has felt left, dejected, and lonely. But veterans are, of course, not the only group to experience loneliness. New parents, university students, senior citizens, and many others feel similar isolation. And without a support network of family or community, it can be easy to feel lonely during these times. It is during these traditional periods, transitional periods, that the Scottish Government should focus its attention. The Connected Scotland report recommends volunteering as one of the many ways to ease loneliness, and I wholeheartedly agree with it. Uh, for youth especially, volunteering is an effective way to tide their own loneliness and tie it over and alleviate that for others. Scotland has a vast network of befriending groups and volunteer opportunities you can tap into and expand. And we call for a national uh, volunteer accreditation scheme to encourage this expansion. And I fully agree with Sandra White in setting up a national register for organizations to deliver this support in Scotland. And well done to her mentioning it. Uh, one way to encourage this inclusion is focusing on the hub of the community and showing that our local centers can offer to those more susceptible learners, like at Tesco and Mary Hill, simply, uh, simply training staff members to personally greet regular customers at shops and community centers can go an awful long way. And think of the places you go each week without a second world thought. The local shop, the post office, your child's football matches. These are all places where community members can connect with each other and enjoy social interaction. For the elderly living alone, this can sometimes be the only interaction they have in a day, or even that district nurse coming up the glen once a week. Which is, why, which is one reason why it is a shame that closures of bank branches like those in Helensborough and Renfrewshire and of community centres like Westerton Library near Bears Den are becoming more common. We must encourage local councils to keep libraries open. And, not, and just as last week, a constituent said to me, it is depressing and demoralizing to hear the progressive dismantling of this vital service. The trend needs to stop and reverse. And she wrote of the bustle of families um, and neighbors doing more than just checking out books. And in face of financial and community services moving online, there is still no replacement uh, for uh, human traditional communication. At the end of this debate, I hope we can look forward ourselves to find the best solution. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, action to stem the tide of social isolation and to, and to include everyone, our veterans, our senior citizens, our university students, LGBT youth and more. The Connected Scotland report is an encouraging step in the right direction, but means very little without sustained efforts. And I hope to see an increase in measures to create closer and engaged communities and to see more volunteers in the communities for people to be aware of the resources that are available before it's too late. And as I said, no, no, look no, out no, for no, others, no, not no. just yourselves. Thank yes, you. Yes, there you go. That was a long conclusion. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I want to begin by thanking the Government and the Minister for bringing forward this debate today and to also recognise the many excellent contributions from across the Chamber as I rise to be the last backbencher to speak. It's been a very interesting debate and I think it's captured really two of the broad areas. One is about what we can practically implement to reduce and tackle isolation and loneliness, but also the broader cultural response we need to ultimately intervene early and to mitigate loneliness when it occurs and to reflect upon how our society perhaps creates environments where loneliness and social isolation can take place that will not necessarily be solvable in one year with one strategy in the term of a parliament but a, t a desire to do so should inform our longer term thinking. But I, I would like to begin by um, just highlighting some of the outstanding work that goes on within my own constituency of Renfrewshire South. Um, Renfrewshire is of course home to the outstanding reaching older adults in Renfrewshire who do fantastic work along, across the local authority. And I was pleased to meet with a representative of them um, 
late last year to hear about some of our pioneering work, particularly around reducing falls in older people. Much of this has been pioneered through the Otago classes. This was a form of light exercise developed at the University um, um, of Otago in New Zealand, in a medical school, and it's specifically designed, as I say, to help prevent falls in older people, but it also has that um, beneficial effect of creating an opportunity for older people to come together and to socialise. And they have health and wellbeing clubs across Renfrewshire, including an elderly in my constituency at Linwood Health Centre and at the MacKillop Institute in Loch Winnock as well. Loch Winnock is also the home to some fantastic pioneering efforts as well. There is a brilliant Loch Winnock Elderly Forum led by the indefatigable Anne Nicol. It's always a highlight of the year to attend their St Andrew's lunch. And they are a group who provide a, a great and a very much treasured resource for many older people across Loch Winnock and help to tackle isolation and loneliness. And they do not just keep themselves to themselves, they work with the community council and they also work with the dementia friendly village having um, bi-monthly tea dances of which I have been had the pleasure of attending, though I have been told that my slosh leaves much to desire and I've got a long way to go to match my constituency colleague Mary Black in that, but I am working on it. And I'm sure if the Minister has an opportunity to come along, maybe we can try and do a dance together, as long as it's not the slosh. I'd obviously want to um, mention as well some of the other community groups within the constituency, the old Kobarkin Library. Um, they provide a fantastic hub. But there's one I'm really looking forward to mention, and that is the Barhead Men's Shed, who, of course, in page 36 of this strategy, get a mention, and their fantastic chairman, Alex Story. I've had an engagement with the Men's Shed in Barhead um, since really now for over the last 18 months to two years and I've been very pleased to be able to help them in some specific um, matters relating to their premises. But it was a great pleasure to, to, to meet Alex again. He, he didn't remember me but I had remembered him from when I was five or six years old and he is someone who has taken his skills and his leadership um, attributes and has applied it to as chairman of a Barhead Men's Shed um, to creating a resource which is much valued by both men and women across Barhead. And they recently celebrated their, their fifth birthday. And I'm very much looking forward to um, tabling a, member, a motion for members' debate to recognise that and the men's shed movement more broadly. And I hope when that motion appears on the business bulletin that it will secure cross-party support where we can all celebrate the fantastic work that men's sheds do in communities across Scotland and in particular in tackling loneliness and isolation. And I think the, the words of Alex's story are, are well worth sharing. He said that our members are proud and delighted to help the local community, schools and nurseries and retirement homes, but most importantly take time to share, help and listen to our members who are living in social isolation. As one of our widowed members said, loneliness is a disease. Let's all help to eradicate this disease in our society. And having spoken with members of the Men's Shed, the impact that it has upon them is clearly profound. For many of us would say that they do not know what they would be doing if they did not have that resource there. Some say it would be either going to the pub or sitting at home watching the television. And these personal testaments are incredibly powerful and underline the case why we have to continue to support the Men's Shed movement, something I am glad that the Scottish Government is committed to continue doing. Mark Griffin, who I co-chair of the Carer CPG um, with, uh, was very um, right to highlight the fact that eight out of 10 carers report feeling loneliness or socially isolated. Now, clearly the government has taken positive action around the Carers Act, but we know there's more we can do. One area of which I think is incredibly important is the Carer Positive Employer Scheme, of which I secured a member's debate last year. And I would again encourage members to take this up. This is about promoting positive employment practices which allow carers to continue in work. We know that a very powerful um, and effective way of tackling isolation and loneliness is to be in employment with the professional and personal relationships that we can form in the workplace. So clearly it is imperative as we move from 700,000 over to over a million people who will be caring and work responsibilities in Scotland over the coming decades, that all employers, large and small, do all that they can to make sure that their workplace environments support carers so that carers can stay in employment. Just before closing, President Officer, I think there's been many, many well-made points regarding digital isolation and the two species. There is digital isolation from perhaps not being connected and being able to gain access to the internet, but there's also digital saturation where our lives become entirely mediated through the forums of social media, be that Twitter or Facebook. And these very artificial re relationships that we can consequently form can have a damaging and negative effect, something that's been highlighted 
But again, in conclusion, President Officer, I would just like to thank the Government for bringing forward this debate, and I look forward to seeing its implementation over the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Nalik Rowley to close for Labour. Mr Rowley, please. Mm -hmm. hey, thank you, President Officer. Could I begin by, by, I want to pick up a point that Sandra White made, because she said she was sorry that the Labour Party criticised the strategy. No place today has any Labour speaker criticised the strategy. And we did, we've made clear that whether our amendment gets support or not, we will be supporting the government motion because we have consistently supported this strategy. We've consistently said that loneliness and isolation has a knock-on effect on health, on, on, on mental health uh, and well-being. So, so to, for an avoidance of doubt, we absolutely support the strategy. What we've said today and what our amendment has tried to put forward is that to try and implement this strategy at the same time as you have failed austerity, uh, impact on communities, impact on public services is really difficult and many of the briefs and organisations that have written in actually said that. Indeed, I remember quoting last year the group from North Ayrshire, uh, the based charity food train, and they described the strategy as just words on a page without funding for lifeline services. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that uh, no matter where we go. And the million pound investment, whilst, whilst obviously welcome, the million pound against a 300 and odd million pound cut in local authority budgets, the majority which, by the way, will be, uh, will be, will be used for cuts in services such as many of the services that was, was raised today. You know, members have talked about the cut to public toilets. It's one of the first that goes in many services and many councils because it's an easy cut to make. The Highlands is the latest Highland Council that said they were going to be cutting toilets. The Borders uh, already, many of the others, and Age Scotland and Age UK have produced reports telling you about the devastating impact of the failure to have public toilets for older people going out into to, to the, the shop areas. So again, isolation. Gingerbread Fife, and, and this is another point I want to make, Gingerbread Fife just now are saying that they are going to have to uh, pay off over 20 workers, uh, that, that they cannot continue to support the 739 families at the present time. And the reason isn't a cut from the council, the reason is that they have been securing project funding through the Scottish Government and through other organisations and the council, and they point out that that project funding is coming to an end. The million pound that we're taught about spending uh, within this strategy is for projects, to fund projects. And the problem with funding projects is when the money comes to an end, then if there is no core funding to support those projects, those projects fall and all the good work that's going on falls with that. So there needs to be, I would say to Sandra White and others, there needs to be a bit of reality here in terms of the strategy. You know, you can have all the strategies in the world and this parliament is good at passing strategy, but if you don't have the resources to support the implementation of these strategies, then they actually become meaningless. Yeah. Sandra White. I thank the member for taking an intervention on that point. Um, do you agree that the fact that uh, you know, Smith Commission actually recommended that the Scottish Parliament have control of all welfare, but the Labour Party did not support that? Would that not have been helpful in this, this regard when you're talking about austerity? And also, you must remember your own colleagues in Westminster actually supported it along with the Tories. Alec Rowley. Well, you can, you, you, I would say to you, you can keep going back over who supported what at what time. I've, I've always been very clear in terms of my support for devolution in Scotland that if we need powers in this parliament, and the case is overwhelming to have those powers in this parliament, then we should have those powers. And those of us who support much stronger devolution for Scotland and for this place would, would, would say that. So, so in terms of whether it's powers in, uh, over welfare, powers over immigration, powers over a number of areas where the case can be made, then we should have those powers to this parliament. And I think that's a view that's widely supported across Scotland by, by, by all sides of the argument. Uh, but can I say that, that in terms of the wider arguments in terms of here, we have the Inclusion Scotland who talk about the rationing of social care, further increases, social isolation amongst 
disabled people. In terms of social care, we know that what happens in councils, in order to make the cuts, they change the eligibility criteria. And just on Monday morning, the BBC programme Call K was actually discussing how difficult it is for people to be able to get social care packages of support and many being turned down for them. If the eligibility criteria has changed that much, the same with lunch clubs for older people, they've changed the eligibility criteria. So if you've not got dementia and you're not in the most dire need of support, you don't get to go to these clubs anymore. Now that wasn't the case even a decade ago. So we have to wake up to the reality that austerity is impacting on frontline services that will not help this strategy be achieved. And we, know, we also need to accept that austerity is not an economic decision. Indeed, if it were, it would be a terrible economic decision. Austerity is a political decision. It's a political decision that was made by the government in Westminster, and it's a political decision to pass that on, plus further cuts to local councils. And that's where the impact is taking place. It's also interesting that Homestar Scotland produced a brief for today, and they say we also highlight the threat of closure and the contraction of local Homestar family support services as local authorities wrestle with difficult budget decisions and the big lottery fund grants budget for Scotland falls yet again. We have the Royal College of General Practitioners. They also raise about funding and needing more funding for local services. So I would say, let there be no doubt in terms of a consensus to support the strategy. But the people out there know that there are real terms cuts taking place in local community services across Scotland, and they will reach a point where they'll begin to think that this place is fully hot air because we can't deliver on these strategies unless we recognise we need to halt austerity. Austerity is bad for Scotland, it's bad for communities in Scotland, and it needs to be halted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowley. And now, calling Michelle Ballantyne to close to the Conservatives, please, Ms. Ballantyne. Thank you, Dep Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I welcome the opportunity to close for the Scottish Conservatives in what I think has been quite a valuable debate on the problems of social isolation and loneliness. And there have been um, very many well considered and insightful points raised in the debate today. And generally, it seems that the whole chamber is united in its desire to see levels of social isolation and loneliness reduced in Scotland. So the Connected Scotland strategy document released last month has, I think, rightly enjoyed cross-party support because it is based on community-led proposals for dealing with social isolation and loneliness. And I'm pleased to see that several of the points raised in the document align with those expressed in the Scottish Conservatives' Loneliness Action Plan that Annie Wells referred to earlier, which was released last month. Now, the Connected Scotland document um, paints a very vivid picture of the problem of loneliness in Scotland and its st statistics, many of which have been presented in the Chamber today. And they highlight the fact that loneliness can affect people of all ages and social backgrounds. And it's reassuring to see that this has been acknowledged by the Scottish Government. And given the subjective nature of loneliness, it is important that local groups are encouraged and empowered to tailor support to the needs of their community. Um, the Minister and a number of colleagues have emphasised the importance of volunteering in addressing the issues of loneliness today. Um, so I'd like to start by highlighting um, one that I've come across, and it's called the Volunteering for Wellbeing Initiative, which began in 2017 as a joint enterprise between Volunteer Centre Borders and Borders NHS, with the aim of tackling loneliness. Now, the difference here is that the project matches voluntary positions to those who have described themselves as being lonely. So once in work, the volunteers, i.e. the people who, who were feeling lonely, then have regular meetings to assess how their voluntary work has eased their loneliness. And this initiative is exactly the sort of thing that is needed to combat loneliness in communities. It tailors its support to each individual case, and it seeks to help both the volunteer and the locality. Now, Annie Wells um, talked about the fact that 40% of young people and 79% of adults will experience loneliness. And that means that pretty much all of us in this chamber, in this building, are likely at some point to experience the feeling of loneliness. Now, I do think it's important that we're clear about the difference between loneliness 
and being alone. Being lonely and being alone, two different things. Loneliness is, is, feels draining, it's very distracting, upsetting, and it, of course, can have significant impact on your health and well-being. Whereas being alone is a desired solitude and can feel peaceful, creative and restorative. And, and speaking as someone who comes from a very large family, I can attest to that very much so. And it's the understanding the difference that is going to be really important as we move forward, because ultimately that is the key to happiness for people. And actually, I've had several members, I've noticed, have talked about the impact that social media is having, and it's something that I certainly feel very strong about, because we can't underestimate how important human contact is when we talk about preventing loneliness. So Annie Wells talked about social media, Alex Cole Hamilton described how modern life has contracted social contact, and Alison Johnson said that it is a sad paradox that in a world where we have even more means to communicate with each other, loneliness is increasing. So I think we have to give some serious thought to the things that actually are impacting on our social interaction. Alexander Stewart talked about the important role that GPs have in dealing with loneliness because a vast number of people actually go in to see their GP simply to have somebody to talk to. So the, when the recently announced National Imp Implementation Group, in fact so recent, I only got the letter this morning from the Minister, hot off the press, which I have to say I really welcome and I think it's a great idea. But I was slightly concerned to see that GPs were not on the list. Um, and it may be that you might want to consider whether the... the the organisation that heads up GPs might be a, an added member because they are the first port of call for many lonely people. And that takes me nicely into the, the role of social prescribing because the, <coughs> excuse me, the Royal College of General Physicians also made the point that actually it would really help if they had a list of places that they could send people. Um, they don't use the term, but I actually have heard it mentioned in several formats across this chamber today. Social prescribing is something that we need to give more attention to. Um, yes, certainly. Alison Jones. Yeah, I'd just like to um, mention to the member, I recently visited Age Scotland um, in my region, here in Edinburgh, and I witnessed their community connecting service in action, and that was manned by fabulous volunteers who put older people in touch with a list of local organisations who could do that. Not only that, they followed up to check that the old person, that the person had had the confidence uh, that it had worked out. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing we might Sean be looking Ballington. at. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, as somebody who spent quite a lot of time working in the third sector, we did a number of iterations of trying to list all the things that were available in the communities. But it's something that we've never taken on board nationally or have any system of doing it generally. Um, and certainly the GPs, uh, the Royal College of Physicians, highlighted that if, if a GP could go onto a system and say, ah, you know, Mrs. Jones, you could go to this club or that club, or I will, you know, give you a chitty to go along to there. It would make a big difference. And I think that's something we, we should maybe give some thought to going forward. Um, and I know that uh, Sandra White actually highlighted, I think, that there was, wasn't a register of all the groups that everyone has spoken about. I think that's very true. Although, of course, the minister will now have a long list to visit, I believe, um, from her own <laughs> invites today. Um, so... We've heard about a number of different areas that I think are important that we need to pick up. Uh, we've heard about um, ex-servicemen. My colleague Maurice Corey talked about how lonely and isolated ex-servicemen can feel, and that's to do with a change of life. And I think it's important that we ensure that when people are having massive changes in their lives, there is some point of contact that they can deal with. But I want to feature just for a very short while, because I can see I'm rapidly running out of time, um, my colleague Jeremy Balfour and, and a number of others talked about the impact on disabled people when they can feel incredibly isolated, either through the fear of going out and involving them in society through stigma, but also simply because there is a major lack of opportunity when it comes to an employment market for disabled people. And we all know that our jobs, our employment has a big function to play in our connectivity with the world. So I think, again, that's something we really do need to look at. Um, and I know you're going to wave at me and say, no, so you I'm must just conclude. going to wind up by saying 
This is really an important issue, and I think there's lots of things we can do, and I hope we can work together to do it. Thank you very much. I now call Christina McKelvey to close for the Government Minister till 4.59 or thereabouts, please. Uh, thank you very much, President. I've been very proud to take part and, and lead uh, in this debate today in the Scottish Government's first national strategy in tackling social isolation and loneliness. The liveliness and the passion of today's debate, including the many invitations to fantastic examples of community projects, is most welcome, and I I hope uh, that uh, passion continues throughout and beyond the lifetime of our strategy, including an invitation to teach Tom Arthur how to do the slosh. Who could reject that? Eh? But it's been a real privilege to take up the mantle on the earlier work of my colleague Jean Freeman on this agenda. And from the outset, can I just say I'm happy to meet with members to discuss issues raised in relation to today's, today's debate and any of the impacts that we have on social isolation and loneliness. So I want to put that on the table at the outset. I know that following uh, Jean Freeman's work, the government was pleased to be leading the way as the first administration in the United Kingdom to have produced a strategy for addressing these issues. Now, there's many, many um, examples of issues that people have raised today. So I want to try and get through as many of them as possible. Michelle Ballantyne, Alison Johnson, Sandra White and Emma Harper and others raised the issue about a national information resource or a national register. Can I say we've, we've acknowledged that and we've acknowledged the challenges sharing that information and we're absolutely committed to working with the third sector interfaces to looking at the ways that they do that and explore the best practice and the locator tool at the voluntary action uh, group in South Lanarkshire is a perfect example of that so we're taking that one on board already we were uh, delighted to see the UK and Welsh governments join efforts to build a more connected society with the respective publications of a strategy and discussion paper and we look forward to getting to work on the next stage of our own strategy with lots of great ideas from this debate today but we continue to look for the best practice and ideas across um, the, the, the piece and like Morris Corey I would like to take this opportunity to thank those individuals communities and organizations who have contributed their time their effort their ideas to our consultation and the engagement phases organizations like Brave Hounds as we've heard from Morris Corey today could be an absolute lifesaver for our veterans a great example and I really hope that the strategy and its ambitions resonate with those who contributed and that through our commitments they feel supported in their efforts to create connected cohesive communities now Ruth Maguire Tom Arthur and Emma Harper gave us a real insight into the value of men's sheds and the positive impact of them I agree with them and we're working with men's sheds as well Alec Cole Hamilton raised a very uh, particular issue around about how Prostate Cancer UK is working with William Hill and I've worked very closely with them in my constituency. I met with them just last week to talk about the work they're doing and how we can build some of the social isolation and loneliness uh, efforts into the work that they're currently doing. So another great example. I particularly wanted to thank organisations such as Befriending Networks and Alistair Allen gave us a clear insight and talked about how valuable that work is in rural and island communities. Organisations like Voluntary Health Scotland, Age Scotland, the Samaritans, the Campaign to End Loneliness, the veterans organisations who have worked to both shape this strategy and whose day-to-day -day work helps directly combat the issues we have discussed today. We are aware of the issues of geography, as brought up by Emma Harper and Alistair Allen about islands and rurality. And, and I think the issue about working with the farming community is a great idea, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the choir when they come uh, to Parliament. But of course, there is a broad range of organisations interested in this area, as we've just heard very clearly, and they show a real um, a, a, a commitment to the impact uh, of ending social isolation and loneliness. Some have, these organisations have been around for a long time, like the Glasgow Golden Generations, and, and very rightly lauded by Sandra White, and some are very new and working in, in new and innovative ways. But together across government and the public, third and private sectors, I believe we can build more, a more connected Scotland, where we treat people with kindness and compassion, and where everyone is given the chance to flourish as a valued member of our society. Many members, including Philip McGregor, raised the uh, issues around about uh, people with disabilities, especially young people with disabilities. And I think Shine and Styles sounds absolutely amazing, so I'll be looking forward to that invitation in the post. And Jeremy Balfour very clearly and always in these debates raised some of this, the same concerns around about accessibility and how we can do things differently. I was very happy to support the Learning Disability Alliance Scotland with its production of an easy read version of the strategy, which is a really uh, great um, addition to what we 
we um, can currently do. And can I maybe draw to Jeremy Balfour's attention and maybe the rest of the chamber, the Disability Action Plan, which we published, I just went and looked it up so I could get all the details right. We published in December uh, 2018. We have consulted on a target for disability employment in the public sector. We've held a Congress involving disabled people, employers and unions looking at the disability employment gap. And Fair Start Scotland started in April 2018 providing employment support for disabled people. We are committed to publishing disability pay gap information, equal pay policy and occupational segregation for disabled people information. I would hope that's just a wee insight into some of the actions that were taken in order to take forward some of the, the real concerns that Jeremy Balfour is absolutely committed to and always raises in the chamber. I note that today's announcement of the cross-sectoral national implementation group is, is welcome um, and I'm glad that you've welcomed that and I look forward to chairing this group and establishing some clear plans for developing and delivering our ambitions. Alexander Stewart will be pleased, as many will be I'm sure, to hear that um, every member here today uh, I'm sure will be here uh, pleased to hear this. I will also lead work to strengthen a cross-governmental approach uh, with colleagues. I'll be chairing a steering group of ministerial colleagues across portfolios including mental health children and young people, local government, housing, planning, business, fair work and skills. So right across government, I'm sure you would welcome that. Yeah, of course. Alison Johnson. We've, we've all acknowledged today that, that loneliness is a public health issue. And I wonder um, what role the minister sees the new public health body in Scotland having in combating loneliness? Minister. Um, again, it's, it's another aspect of the work that we continue to develop and I'll be looking forward to working, working with them on that. Um, Alison Johnson raised some very, very clear issues around about public health and how we tackle that. And um, Michelle Ballantyne raised this as well about our work with the Royal College of General uh, Physicians. We have taken on board all of their recommendations. We're working with them and I met with them just at the end of last year in order to, to take those forward and I will continue to take that forward. Alison Johnson also raised in her contribution issue around about transport. And I know transport's a huge issue so I'm not going to get any, any huge detail on that. But accessible transport, as we know, is vital uh, to people being able to meet face-to-face -face and stay socially active. And we're taking forward a review of the national transport strategy on accessibility to make sure that we can have uh, a better uh, option there and, and plan future policy uh, appropriately. Um, oh, there's so much in this debate today um, that you know, would be amazing to take forward. I would like to remind everybody that the University of the Third Age, a movement of retired and semi-retired individuals, encourages lifelong learning and social connection, have an exhibition uh, in the, the Parliament this week, um, uh, from today to the 31st of January. I look forward to seeing you all there. We do recognise that this strategy is the first of many and we have taken uh, steps on that joint journey. And as I say, Alistair Allen earlier gave us a real insight into the pitfalls of social media. And many people talked about digital connectedness, but also talked about how it can disconnect you too. And we have encouraged us to build up uh, our communities. We are committed to taking time to reflect on work, what's working well, with progress reporting every two years. We hope to gain an ever-increasing understanding of these complex issues uh, that work to tackling um, social isolation and um, loneliness. Speakers today mentioned community link workers. This has been piloted both in Glasgow and Dundee with a commitment to 250 community link workers by the end of this parliament. I just turn in my, my final remarks to the Labour amendment today. I have sympathy with Alec Rowley and the Labour Party's uh, position here. We have all seen the impact of cuts to the Scottish Government budget, but I'm sorry I can't support his amendment today because I I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, supportive of the way he's trying to say it. I agree that they are damaged caused by the UK Government's continued austerity. We have called on an end to the austerity of vociferously in this chamber. Countless organisations and the UN Rapporteur have all pointed out to the damage of austerity. But what is also very clear, though, is the response of this government in protecting the people of Scotland from the worst impacts of austerity. A progressive tax policies have meant that the Scottish budget is around £570 million higher. And between 2010 and 11 and 2019-20, Scotland's discretionary resource budget allocation will have reduced in real terms by nearly £2 billion. Yet our decisions on tax and borrowing, which are always made with people of Scotland at the forefront, mean that we have been able to reduce the real terms reduction to our total fiscal budget from 6% to 3.8%, generating an additional 7.7 7, 
£712 million for investment in public services. We are taking decisions, hard decisions, to protect people from austerity, and that is to say nothing of the £125 million that we are spending every year mitigating welfare cuts and protecting those in low incomes. How much more could we spend that £120 million on? I'm sure £25 million on. We, I'm sure we've got lots of ideas. Mark Griff Griffin raised a really uh, interesting point on how we use Social Security to prevent and tackle social isolation. I heard those points, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary heard those points, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss them further. Presiding officer, finally, I am grateful for the opportunity to bring this important uh, issue and ambitious strategy before the Parliament. Sandra White is absolutely right to say that we should all be proud of ourselves here today. I am very proud of the valuable contributions that have helped inform the processes that I am taking forward, and I look forward to work with colleagues across the Chamber in building a connected Scotland. Thank you very much. And that concludes uh, our debate this afternoon. It's time to move on to our next item of business, which is consideration of motion 15582 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on the appointment of a new commissioner for ethical standards in public life. And could I call on Kezia Dugdale to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. Thank you, President Officer. I'm moving the motion in my name on behalf of the Scottish Parliament's corporate body to invite members to agree to the appointment of Caroline Anderson as a new commissioner for ethical standards in public life in Scotland. By way of background, the Scottish Parliamentary Commissioners Act 2010 provides that the Commissioner is to be appointed by the Scottish Parliament corporate body with the agreement of the Parliament. The SPCB sat as a selection panel on the 17th of December 2018. I chaired the panel and the other members were Sandra White and Andy Whiteman. On behalf of the panel, I would like to thank Louise Rose, the independent assessor who oversaw the recruitment process and has provided the SPCB with a validation certificate confirming that the process complied with good practice and that the nomination of Caroline Anderson is made on merit with a fair, open and transparent process. The Commissioner's role is an important one in the statutory framework to secure high ethical standards in public life. The Commissioner is responsible for investigating complaints about the conduct of MSPs, local authority councillors, members of public bodies and non-compliance with the lobbying regime. The Commissioner reports their findings in relation to MSPs and lobbyists to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee and their findings about councillors and members of devolved public bodies to the Standards Commission for Scotland. In addition to their complaints work, the Commissioner also regulates how people are appointed to the boards of public bodies in Scotland <laughs> And if it appears that the Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments to Public Bodies in Scotland has not been complied with, this too is reported to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Turning to our nominee, Caroline Anderson is, un is the unanimous choice of the panel from a strong field of candidates invited to interview. Caroline is a chartered accountant and has over 20 years of specialist experience in regulation and compliance, gained mainly within the prof professional services environment. For a period of seven years, Caroline acted as an independent consultant appraising applications for aid under the EU Special Support Programme for Peace and Reconciliation in Northern Ireland and the Border Counties. And she has also held a number of ministerial appointments including as Chair of the Audit and Risk Committee of the Disclosure and Barring Service and as a Tribunal Member of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. The SPCB believes that Caroline's unique set of skills, knowledge and experience will equip her well in the Commissioner's role. The panel believes that Caroline will bring to the post professionalism, fairness, integrity and high ethical standards and I'm sure that the Parliament will want to wish her every success in her new role. In closing, President Officer, I believe that the Parliament would also wish to record its thanks to the outgoing Commissioner, Bill Thompson, whose term in office will end on the 31st of March 2019, and to wish him a long and happy retirement. President Officer, I move the, nation, the motion in my name. Uh, thank you very much uh, for moving that motion, and the question will be put at decision time. The next item is consideration of business motion 15619 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a change to tomorrow's business. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that num motion number 15619 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. We turn now to decision time. <clears throat> the first question is that amendment 15609.1 in the name of Annie Wells which seeks to amend motion 15609 
in the name of Christina McKelvey on a Connected Scotland, the Scottish Government's strategy for tackling social isolation and loneliness be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 15609.2 in the name of Alex Rowley, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Christina McKelvey be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15609.2 in the name of Alex Rowley is yes, 23, no, 84. There were no abstentions and therefore the amendment is not agreed. The next question is that a motion 15609 in the name of Christina McKelvey as amended on a connected Scotland, the Scottish Government's strategy for tackling social isolation and loneliness be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15582 in the name of Kessie Dugdale on the appointment of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And can I also congratulate Caroline Anderson on behalf of the Parliament. And that concludes... <laughs> and that concludes decision time. We're going to move now to members' business in the name of Graham Simpson on housing through the lens of ageing, but we'll just take a few moments for the member and other members of the Minister to change seats.